All right, so it is Remembrance Day today, and we're on the show. We're going to speak with the soldiers at Soldiers. Sacrifice, dedication, and valor dedicated to speaking out for wounded soldiers, something he's experienced first happened. Captain Simon Mayu is on the show today. Also, one of the most valued writers in this country. The theme of war runs through his work, Three Day Road, the new one which is called The Arenda, and his own struggles with trauma. What brought him back from the brink of the red chair tonight? Joseph Boyden will be here. Also, thoughts on Remembrance Day war and striving for humanity from, uh, if you can believe it, one of the all-time comedy greats. Eddie Izzard. Sloan, take it away. What's going on, everybody? Come on in. Welcome to the program. It is lovely to be with you. This is wonderful Remembrance Day. Uh, my name is George. I hope you took your moment of silence today. It's a day to remember the sacrifice and valor of Canadian soldiers uh, and also the hardship and the loss that civilians endure during the war. And I think in this country, much of the conversation centers around World War I and World War II. World War II especially because Canada, Canada's, you know, unified, uh, fought under its own command. So I just want to start the program off on this day with something like that. It's somebody who has a great passion for history and the role war has played in shaping history. And if you want to talk about the international effects, certainly of World War I and II, um, as Canadians, we go to the Brits. The great comedian and actor Eddie Izzard. This is everybody's war. We're all in this war for victory. A lot of people in the world today are against all war, meaning all use of force. And I'm not quite of that opinion because if aggressive force is used against, like in the Second World War, then I feel you've got to use force back and otherwise Hitler would still be here. <laughs> So I think things can get very confused, but I like to go on the 6th of June every five years to, or even more years to, the D-Day beaches in Normandy. And remember that, and remember Polish fighters and Czech fighters in the Second World War, and what the Canadians did in the Second World War, and it would be good to feel that we were moving away from that. And I do think we are. And on Remembrance Day, it is good and it is necessary to remember people who fought and died to try and have humanity win. And it is winning. Thank you, Eddie. Eddie's fourth major tour works his way through Canada until December the 3rd. You know what Eddie said about striving for humanity? Uh, we are obviously not all the way there yet. Wars do continue. They are real for our guest tonight. All too real. Saw active service in Afghanistan twice. Cost him a lot. Symbolizes, I guess, the sacrifice uh, made by service people. Captain Simon Mayu is his name. It's an extraordinary story. Take a look. November 16th, 2007, Captain Simon Mayu had set out near Kandahar when an improvised explosive device ripped through his light armored vehicle. It was a major tragedy, killing Corporal Nicolas Beauchamp, Private Michel Lévesque, and an Afghan interpreter. Simon was lucky to be alive, but he was severely injured. His jaw fractured, his left leg smashed, and ultimately amputated below the knee. Simon went through grueling rehab, got fitted with a prosthetic, and then, despite even his own doubts, he returned to active service in Kandahar to honor, he says, the lives of the men who died under his command. Now back in Canada, one of the first to receive this sacrifice medal, Simon is lending his support to other Canadians wounded in the line of duty through a program called Soldier On. Please welcome to the program, Captain Simon Mayu. Um, you know, what does today, what does today mean to you? Well, uh, today it's a day of remembrance. It's a day where we, we get to pay respects to uh, people that have been here before us, to people that have been to war before us. Um, but for me, it's also a bit per more personal because um, I lost some of my comrades in Afghanistan. So it's always a day of remembering them personally. And, well, and for, for, for citizens, it's a day of honoring you as well. And that's, I mean, we hear about the sacrifices that soldiers make, and obviously it comes in many different forms, and, and you have as well. Is it an emotional day for you? Oh, every time, yeah. every time. It gets very emotional because it's, it's just when the, this, this trumpet calls and, and there's a moment of silence, yeah. and um, 
it's a five second, it's a minute where, where you just think about their memories and who they used to be and, and how great people they could have been, but they, they, they chose to make a sacrifice for their country. With the accident, the explosion, you got ejected, right? Yeah. And that's just by the seating. Do you feel that? I do. Um, just before we were leaving uh, the FOB, the forward operating base where we stage our operations, um, on the night that it, my incident happened, actually, we were uh, a combat team going out on a, on a mission to seize a territory. And I was commanding the vanguard. And my signaler was there. He takes care of all the communications, all the radios and all that stuff. So he gives me the thumbs up, sir, we're good to go. And he goes in. And usually he was sitting up, checking the stuff. I was on the comms inside. But we decided to switch seats for whatever reason so I could be outside and watch stuff. And that's when the bomb hit. And... It, would it have been a different seating at that time? There would be somebody else talking to you right now. That's something to carry, isn't it? Eh, I, I do. Every time I make a choice of my life, I have to think that, you know, I, I, I have to deserve what they gave me. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't cut short. I can't cut corners. I got to make sure that whatever I do is in honor of them. And whatever sacrifice they made, I got to make up for it. Aside from the fact that you were obviously severely injured and you lost your leg, you went back yeah. to active duty. Yeah. You made a choice with a prosthetic limb to make, to go back. Yeah, uh, it, it, it didn't look as a choice to me. Yeah. It was, uh, I woke up in Germany and the first thing you do is you start counting, you know, the limbs. Is everything there and working? And you figure out one is not there, so, but it was tough. There was dark clouds. You start wondering what you're going to do with your life. But I had left buddies back there, and they were still doing the mission. So for me, it wasn't really an option. It, I had to go back. What's the process by which you break through the, black, the those dark clouds? I used to be platoon commander of a Nuremberg, you know, platoon of, of Kenyan soldiers, the best troops in the world. And I was on tip, you know, the edge of the spear. I was the thing. And then I come back, and now I'm a patient in a hospital bed. I have a hard time just going uh, eating. Yeah. So this is tough, you gotta redefine yourself, but then don't focus on the moment. You gotta know that you know, things are gonna come back. You're gonna get a prosthesis, you're gonna get back to walk, run, you know, you're gonna wear your gear again, and yeah, you keep going. You had to be told multiple times that you had lost your leg? Yeah, yeah. Um, my memory, I had a big concussion and my memory wasn't sinking in. So they kept telling me, I was waking up and I was like, wow, my leg is not there, what's happening? And they kept telling me, well, you know, we had to amputate because it was, it was going bad. And, and then I fell asleep again, woke up, didn't remember anything. So they had to tell me about five times. And at the end, they were kind of like, you know, you lost your leg again. <laughs> and I'm like, whoa, that's kind of mean the way that they say it. I was like, it was the first time for you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. For me, it was the first time that I remember it. But they have been telling me for like 20 times. Answer apology time. I'm going to rapid fire some questions towards you, okay? What's the most, do you watch war films? Yeah, yeah. What's the most honest and accurate portrayal from your estimation? It's a show, Banner Brothers. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's, that, that felt like digging a trench there. What is the stupidest, most unintentional movie about war ever? Most of the Hollywood movies, except a few. Yeah. Like Full Metal Jacket is good, the rest. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when, not if, but when the NHL returns to Quebec City, yeah. will they be the Nordiques or something else? They will be the Nordiques. Yeah? I still have the t-shirt and the cap. You do, eh? Oh yeah, it's are you, waiting. Are you looking forward to that first game against the Habs? I do, because my dad was taking me to games back then. I'm looking forward to like, my, my daughter to games. When, when the Nordi Nordiques left, did you root for the Montreal Canadiens? I had to. Yeah, it's hard, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the most, that's the most pained you've looked in this entire interview. <laughs> you talked about everything. <laughs> Losing a leg, we can deal with, but hockey it gets to us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have a question for you from over here. Bonjour, Capitaine Mayou. It was so wonderful to have you by my side at Rideau Hall, across Canada and abroad. You are such a thoughtful, courageous man very sensitive to the needs of others. So tell us what makes you volunteer. You know, our Governor uh, General, current Governor General David Johnson is big into this is my giving moment. Of course, Mikhail Jean, Governor General, was very much into this as well. I, yeah. you, you know her, you know, why volunteer? You can watch the news and see another country self-destruct, but 
I want to do something about it. I just don't want to watch it, make a comment, and turn the page. I want to do something about it. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's critical. We want to get involved. And um, the forces allow you to do that. They, they allow you to go across the world and reach people. I mean, I'm not changing foreign policy. I'm not changing the way Canada is. I'm going to help Afghans one-on-one. -on -one. I'm helping villagers to build a school. And that's what it felt like for you? It does, very much so. Okay. That's, that's when you, you actually make a difference. A pleasure to see you. Thanks for your time today. For more on how to honor and remember Canada's veterans, the Veterans Affairs Canada website, which is veterans.tc.ca. Captain Simon Mayu, we'll be right back. Okay, man. All right, coming up, Giller Prize winner, Governor General's Award finalist, punk rocker. We'll sort through it with Joseph Boyd next. Back here on the program, um, looking forward to this next conversation. War and loss, a theme uh, through his work. Uh, just a boy when he lost his father, war hero. Lots of his own personal struggles to get through as well. Much celebrated author, including uh, oh, this Wednesday, the Governor General's Literary Awards. Uh, he's a guy that you know people talk an awful lot about. He's got a hell of a story, but an incredible way of sharing it. I'm excited to have Joseph Boyden in the show. Here's the story. You know, it's safe to say that even in his lowest moments, back when he was a teen searching, that Joseph Boyd never imagined where he'd end up. And what a star. His first novel, Three Day Road, the story of two Cree men in the First World War, international bestseller. His second, which also drew on his Ojibwe heritage, was called Through Black Spruce. It uncovered the harsh reality of modern Aboriginal life, won a Giller Prize. But here's the thing. There was a time when Joseph was totally lost. 16 years old, suffering from depression, tried to end his life. And then two things happened. He discovered punk rock and got serious about writing. And I suppose a whole lot of luck as well. It helped. He roamed the U.S. like a modern-day Kerouac, found his voice as a writer, a writer who's taken on the big questions in our history, and they don't get bigger than his new one. It's called The Orenda, a bloody, at times brutal, fictional account of the wars that gave rise to our nation. I love this guy. Please welcome back to the show, Joseph Borden. Nice to see you. And you. See you at a rock and roll show, see you here. <laughs> so yeah. tell people who don't know what Orenda is, it's your book, but tell them what the concept of Orenda is. Orenda is, what? Well, then they're not going to read the book. No, listen, they, they're <laughs> going to read the book. First of all, lovely birch trees everywhere, but the, uh, just the idea of spirit and, what, and where it can take hold. Uh, Orenda is, is uh, the idea, the First Nations belief, uh, specifically here, the Haudenosaunee belief uh, and the, the Wendat belief that everything in, in life has its own soul. The Christians believe that only humans can contain a soul. Um, these people believe... Are you suggesting in Christians novel? hate puppies? Not that they hate them, they just don't believe the puppies will follow you to heaven. Right, which sucks. So, yeah, which Who wants to is a go? Bummer. Well, exactly. Uh, to me, heaven is a bunch of puppies just <laughs> running around biting It's <laughs> amazing. But, but, but Orenda is, is the idea that not just humans have soul, but everything in nature. Uh, trees, uh, bodies of water. Lake Ontario has in its own Orenda. Um, you walk outside and a sparrow flies down. It has, it has its own soul, its own belief, its own Orenda. Does the concept of Orenda resonate with you in your daily life? Absolutely, because it's very similar to, you know, my family, I'm a mixed blood family. I grew up very kind of Irish Catholic, yeah. suburban Toronto, you know, but part of my family is, is Nishinaabe, is Ojibwe, and, and part of that is this idea of nature and the natural and, and, and the Manitou, which is the Orenda, the idea that everything in our world is imbued by its own spirit, and you, re you recognize that and you thank it. Growing up, you know, like Irish Catholic in Toronto yeah. in that era, when did you start to identify more with your, you know, the First Nation roots? 14, 15, 16, when I was really getting rebellious and into my kind of punk stage. I was actually going to a, a I think I've told you this story before. Oh yeah, where'd this. you find that? Look, right, look at this picture. <laughs> Let's put it on the screen here. You know what's interesting about this? <laughs> so you're the Iroquois, the Mohican, you have that, yeah. but you're going to a school called Brebuff, uh, the, who the Iroquois yeah. went to town on. Well, this is why, I was, I, for years, I tried to get kicked out of my Catholic high school, Brebuff. <laughs> Ray Buff was one of the martyrs, the, Cash, the Catholic uh, Jesuit martyrs who was uh, tortured to death by the, the Haudenosaunee people in 1649. And, and that's kind of the climactic moment of this novel. Not that Bray Buff is the character, but he's certainly inspired by. And uh, so I was going to this school and 
I look back now on Jesuit high school and I think, what amazing educators, powerful, amazing people. But I was so rebellious, I just wanted to get kicked out. It took me four years, and I finally figured out how to do it. I did everything. It Wait, was... four years is also how long it takes to graduate, bro. No, it was five at the time. <laughs> but uh, that's how old I am. But uh, there's still a grade 13. But. Uh, for four years, I thought and thought, how am I going to do this? And I tried and tried, and I thought, oh, wait a second. I'm into the punk rock. I cut my hair into the Mohawk, and the Mohawk people, you know, the, the Iroquois people are the ones who tortured Ray Buff to death. So yeah. if I do this, they'll get the message. So that it was your it's, conscious it's, choice. Yeah, yeah. And did it work? It worked. Well, they gently asked me to leave, not so much as <laughs> kicked me out. Wow, where are you getting these? Huh? Talk to me about this, young this gentleman. Great. Number 55, Joseph Boyden. Captain of the football team. Look at the smiley face here. Look at this guy. Yeah, that's me as a young, this is me at 13, 14, yeah. this is me at 15. Do you know at this point that you have this creativity that has to come out? I do, but I don't know how to contain it or control it. And what ended up happening to me is I, um, I got really, I was, I was suffering from depression as a kid. And I'm, I, I freely talk about it now, but it was something that you didn't talk about that was bad, that, uh, you, you know, was a weakness. But I was, I was depressed, I became suicidal, like, I'm captain of the defense of my football team, and you know we're doing great. And and uh, I become really, really depressed, and I I end up trying to kill myself on my 16th birthday. Right. And uh, and I, I've written something for CBC about this, and and talked about it because I hope that my story, even if it changes one young person's view on what they're going to do and stops them from doing it, it's worth me saying it's not a weakness. This is something that uh, affects you. A number of us, and and you know, and I and I say, what what if I had actually done it? I, and I was serious about it. I jumped in front of a car, like a moving car coming down the street, and it ran me over. And the only reason I lived is because the undercarriage of the car captured. It was on my birthday. Halloween is my birthday. It was the undercarriage of the car captured my jacket and dragged me, rather than the second wheel running me over. Otherwise, I would have been dead for sure. But I died a number of times. My heart stopped on the on the ambulance on the way to the to the hospital. And I think to myself, no, what if, it, if I had done it? Like, I would never write these novels. I wouldn't get to know, you know I wouldn't be on TV. It's yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> but, but more importantly, it's the little things in life, you know, just you know, getting to spend this kind of wonderful existence with my wife and our dog down in New Orleans and, and just all of these things that I would not have experienced. So I, I really, really, you know, I came out very nervously um, with a, with a you know, to admit that I, yeah, I tried to kill myself more than once, and I'm so happy I didn't. People talk about in the moment that you make the decision to do that, you instantly regret it. Oh, God, yeah. I didn't even have a chance to regret it. I regretted it afterwards. Did you, how conscious were you? I immediately, it was such a violent kind of collision that I was out. The first memory I have is opening my eyes just for a second in intensive care and trauma, and seeing my mom Blanche, who is this incredible woman who's raised all of us children single-handedly because my father passed uh, you when I was young. young. And Blanche looking over me, my mom, and a teardrop. I remember tears hitting my face like rain and, uh, and realizing, what did I do? What was the first conversation with your mom like after that? It was tough because, again, it was, it was a matter of we didn't know how to address this or approach this. It was like, it was a, you know... It must have been a mistake. Look at you. You're, you're handsome, Joseph, and you're, 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 you're popular, and you're, you're all these things. And I'm like, no, I'm nothing. I'm worthless, you know? And, and that's the weird thing about, about depression and about youth. And so many of us face this when we're at those turbulent, turbulent years, you know? Well, we're thankful. It was tough. It was tough. Part of the reason why you're able to write so beautifully about the world around us is because you realize you may have missed it? You know, I've never thought of it that way, but yeah, I think that's a... Lovely poetic way to put it. Uh, um, I, you have a I cherish. I cherish each day that I have now, and I cherish my big, beautiful, loud, nutty family around me. And I'll, I'll admit that you know I still suffer at times from from the darkness. I call it. But but you know this is why I I, I write in order to free that, to get rid of that darkness. And so and you can see the darkness comes into these yeah. books, you know, into my books. But uh, it's a way of freeing myself. And 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 that's what saved me when I was a teen. You know, I. Write, wrote poetry, horribly, uh, angst-ridden poetry as a teenager that I would never show anyone. And Come on. I didn't. I didn't until I got to university and, and took it a little more seriously and started publishing uh, some, but I wouldn't show any of it to anyone. But that's what kind of, it was the, the release. It was the way of allowing that pent-up frustration and anger just to, to come out. And, and so it was great. Stick around more with Joseph right after this.
when we get back to our conversation with Joseph, you know, what's it like for a Canadian living in the U.S. to tell the world our stories? Back here with Joseph Boyd, a man who is so generously written about Canada. Do you feel like you're, you're out there representing who we are, living in America and, and, and writing books that are international? I, I, I'm never so big-headed as to think that I'm, I'm representing something as big and beautiful as this country, but certainly I want to have my say, you know? I want to be that bridge between, and I've been told I'm that bridge between, by some important people, between two cultures that don't, or many cultures that don't often get along, you know, or see eye to eye. What's your favorite childhood memory from Willowdale? Favorite childhood memory, going to the ravine. There was a great ravine right by our house and uh, tobogganing there in winter and then wandering through and playing soldiers uh, with my brothers and I and friends uh, in summer. Which side were you on? Always the Canadian Army. Yeah. My dad was a doctor in the Army, so, so yeah. You were representing him? I was representing my dad. Fighting for him? <laughs> yeah. What a pleasure to see you, man. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, it's great to see you. Thank you very much, everybody. We'll just call the wind up and be right back. Thank you so much to Captain Simon Mayu. Thanks to Joseph Boyd in the new book called The Arenda, Eddie Azard. Uh, let me just tell you who's coming up on the show in the coming weeks. Sue Grafton, great author, Jeremy Irons. And if you want to get your Jesus on, Joel Osteen's going to be here as well. And if you don't want to get your Jesus on, Joel Osteen will still be here. It's a pleasure to be with you. Good things, Canada. Yeah.